I thought what I would do is, uh, is give an overview, not so much of the book, uh, but one thread of the book. And I've talked about parts of it, some of it in this room, we talked about Latin America and the role of field work uh, in, his, uh, in his life and in his intellectual imagination. Uh, Paul Krugman and Angus Deaton and others, and I had a discussion about Hirschman and economic thought. So I thought I would um, both move backwards and forward talking to you about him. And one of the questions I often get about the book is, why should anybody read Hirschman now? Um, I don't have a very good answer to that question. I, I prefer that people have their own readerly experiences and then puzzle for themselves why anybody would want to read classics or anything that would even deign to bear the title essential anything. Um, but I would just signal a couple of things uh, and uh, they will be elements that I'll unfold for the next half hour or so and then we can have questions. One is to draw some attention to his style of social science, uh, the ways in which he crossed geographic, political, and disciplinary uh, borders that now have become very institutionalized in our universities um, and what that does and does not do for styles, what he would call a cognitive style uh, of inquiry. And the other is, and this will perhaps be a stronger theme in what I talk about now, uh, what the role of an exemplary life is. And I, I say that, I'm not sure if that's a problem for us here, uh, but because the concept of an exemplary life nowadays is perhaps difficult to grasp. When the Washington Post, uh, when Albert died uh, almost a year ago, a, uh, the obituary writer for the Washington Post called me and said, you know, can you tell, give me, you know, the five minute version of his life, because I have to turn this over tomorrow. And uh, what would you say? What, what, you know, what do we get from Hirschman? And I said, well, the exemplary life. And she, huh? Uh, and I began to talk about what he'd gone through, what he'd seen, what he participated in over the course of the 20th century, and his relationship to history. Uh, and she didn't get it. And I said, so I can't, this is maybe an indelicate question, but how old are you? <laughs> and uh, I think she, was, she had just graduated from college. That's fine. Although I thought it was very odd that a, an author of obituaries would be 22 years old. You know, how do you conceptualize a life as a subject that you would write about? I thought it was a little weird. But she was having clearly difficulty grappling with this idea that one would choose to lead a life a particular way. And I'll, I'll get into that in more detail uh, very shortly. But for him, it was uh, the way in which he inhabited a world of ideas and the way he thought about the role of ideas in the world is, is, is the theme I want to focus on. The role of action, observation, analysis, and how that analysis then proceeds to inform the way we act uh, in the world. In a way, he was, as Shayla Ben Habib has said in actually a really, really nice essay in the latest Journal of Democracy, uh, he was our first real and possibly last cosmopolitan moralist. Um, but I want to draw attention to uh, one part of that, which is that his model, or his, his, his style of framing puzzles and trying to solve them. So this transnational life that he, he led drew him uh, across cultures, across countries, across academic traditions and disciplines. And he would combine and amalgamate a repertoire out of all of this. Uh, rather than having, as you are going to see momentarily, one aspect of his life or one chapter of his life replace uh, uh, the previous chapter of his life. This is a story of accumulation of resources, thoughts, visions that he draws from the multiple intellectual and cultural traditions of what we might call the quote unquote West. Um, this is, by the way, a photograph of Albert in 1962 taken by a, a, a very well known uh, Colombian uh, 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 photographer. I'll get back to what's happening to him in 1962 in just a minute. Uh, in writing a book like this, uh, two uh, challenges um, were 
uh, faced me. The first is, is a methodological one as a global historian. For those of us who, in the room who try to do world or global history, trying to write a life in the world, a life of the world through one person, there was the problem of scale, more familiar uh, issue. Uh, uh, the problem in this case of doing a micro history of something more global is uh, new trying to come up with new categories of evidence. And the third one was, in a sense, the fugitive pieces. How to give a human structure to a spatially very complex, fractured, and discontinual world and life, as you're going to see shortly. And it would be very hard, uh, in some ways, to imagine a social scientist like him nowadays. Uh, and we can ask ourselves why that might be. The second methodological, how to bring coherence to all of the parts, the second one is more specific to the biographical genre. I am not a biographer. I've never written a biography before. This was my first foray into the species. I highly recommend it. It really changed. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to ever write anything again, if I ever will unless Nassau Hall releases me from my thraldom. But uh, the biographical genre, it poses some very specific challenges. Uh, how to articulate or how to collapse the distance between uh, the lived experience and the inner life and the outer life, the work that we see in The Essential Hirschman. Uh, and how do you put those two sides of the equation together? Well, let's move into the story, because one device for literary biographers is to use fiction to fill the holes. Right? And, and best exemplified, my favorite biographer is a literary biographer called Hermione Lee. Read the biography of Virginia Woolf. It is an amazing book. Uh, where she uses in drama the characters to speak for the inner life of the character. So who Virginia Woolf writes about his characters speak to an experience that Wolf is herself having in the world. How do you do this for a nonfiction writer is a challenge. Now, thankfully, Hirschman was a prodigious concept builder, constantly throwing out aphorisms, models, concepts uh, to use famous turns of phrases. I'll get to some of these metaphors, keywords. So what I'm going to do is use perhaps his most famous, not my preferred one of all, but the one that made him a global intellectual celebrity in the late 1960s is Exit Voice and Loyalty. Because the presentation now is going to focus on his multiple departures, his multiple exits from Germany, from France, from Italy, from Spain, from the United States, from Colombia. And it forces us to ask, what does exit mean uh, to be pushed or pulled to leave the country in which one lives, the language with which one speaks. This was not just a theoretical problem, in other words, for Hirschman, uh, but it reveals something about the complexity of the man and the complexity of the world. So let's start. I, I, the, the book is very long, so I'm going to rely a lot more on images rather than my words to tell the story. Let's start with Hirschman in 1924. This is a, a, a nine-year-old Berliner, the son of an upper-middle-class bourgeois, assimilated Jewish family. We can talk about what that Weimar generation of assimilated Jews, uh, uh, in a sense, what the world looked like uh, for that generation. And in a sense, he would remain throughout his life loyal to many of the underlying principles that the Weimar Republic, fragile as we know it turned out to be, um, for, for many of the principles that it stood for. Tolerance, cosmopolitanism, uh, experimentation, um, even if, as many would see in retrospect, its underlying institutional foundations were much weaker than people thought. So in a way, while he was loyal to many of the principles of uh, the Weimar Republic, it also summoned voice on his part. Uh, and this is, by the way, a, a picture of him at the French gymnasium. So part of this cosmopolitan Weimar world included him studying in a French lycée uh, in Berlin. Um, this is Hirschman uh, right here. These are his professors. 
Uh, this is a, a very interesting school established by Huguenots who were refugees themselves. Uh, and his relationship to Huguenots throughout his life is, is, is actually a fascinating one. Actually, the role of French Protestantism in his thinking is something worth uh, uh, considering. And it was out of this school uh, that his voice would be summoned uh, to declare loyalty to these principles of the Weimar Republic in the form of his uh, militancy. He became a very active member of the German Social Democratic Party as a young more a member of the radical wing of the Social Democratic Party. Uh, and it would be in this uh, context that he would really uh, learn the classics of uh, German idealism and the foundations of Marxism. I won't go into uh, detail on that right now. Uh, we can talk about it if, if, if you're interested. But it was that very militancy that threw him into uh, the political arena. He graduates from the Lycée uh, in uh, 1932, goes to the University of Berlin, spends one semester at the University of Berlin, which is one of, if you know anything about what happens to German universities with the rise of Hitler, they become the hotbeds for the polarization. People often forget that uh, students can be equally prone to become ultra reactionary as well as ultra radical and the University of Berlin was uh, one of these hotspots. After one semester he was forced to go underground as uh, Nazis started to pick up people's address books. Uh, his closest friend, a man called Peter Frank, was arrested. His uh, address book was taken. It was only a matter of days before Hirschman would be uncovered and he leaves. His first flight, first exit and he goes to Normandy. And there's a photograph of Albert with his uh, sister who's a year and a half older than him, Ursula. She plays an important role in his life uh, for reasons I'll get to in just a minute. This is the first, this is the summer of 1933 uh, in Normandy. They both had to flee. She's a member of the Communist Party. They have both had to flee. And a question arises immediately, how much did he leave Germany? How much did he leave Berlin because he was driven out? How much did he do this uh, voluntarily? Uh, because it's very clear that his decision to go to France was partly driven by pull factors, his interest in, in a sense, reinventing himself. And that's what he would do over and over again. And that, they're in beginning the process of accumulating cultural and intellectual resources with each setting that he would be displaced to. And this set the stage for the long European, short in the number of years, but uh, peregrinations uh, around Europe, his Europeanization. From France, where he would study, uh, he would then go to uh, England. Uh, he would, what, when uh, the Spanish Civil War broke out in July, middle of July uh, 1936, within a week, he was on a train uh, to Barcelona. Uh, so his militancy, his exit is combined with his uh, um, almost reflexive decision to go to the front of wherever uh, the struggle against fascism is unfolding. Several years in Italy. In a sense, he's clearly trying to make it in one way because he begins to accumulate credentials. In Paris, he gets a degree from HSC, he then goes to the London School of Economics, eventually winds up at the University of Trieste where he receives a uh, PhD. Uh, but he's doing more than looking for credentials. He's creating a space uh, for becoming an intellectual and a particular kind of intellectual given his engagements, right, and his, his commitments and his loyalties to particular causes. And we can start to see the accumulation then of uh, these repertoires from German idealism uh, to empirical Anglo-American uh, political economy and uh, Italian uh, liberal socialism. And here I want to dwell a little bit on the role that Ursula plays because she marries an Italian philosopher who will introduce Albert to the whole world of Italian uh, intellectual uh, traditions and at that moment uh, culminating in, and it was called liberal socialism by Gobetti, uh, a whole world of uh, activist scholars who were neither Marxists 
nor liberals, and trying to find a space uh, between the two. Eugenio Colorni, the brother-in-law, in particular, became very close to Hirschman, not just introducing him then to the Italian traditions, but the broad European literary traditions. It was really at the hands of Colorni that Albert starts to read Flaubert, um, and particularly uh, Montaigne. And I come back to Montaigne over and over again. And now they coined between them, between Eugenio and Albert, they coined a little term um, that has kind of taken off with reviewers. Uh, if any of you read the Cass Sunstein review in the New York Review, but they love this concept of proving Hamlet wrong. And the idea was that they should not let their indecision or their uncertainty about the world be paralytic. That you could still act decisively, choose to do something in the world, to change the world, even if you didn't know everything. That full and complete knowledge was not a necessary precondition for action. You're going to see that that evolves and really informs his style of social science by the time you get to the 60s and 70s, as he's very critical of the ways in which particularly American social science uh, is going. So that uncertainty was not necessarily paralytic. Wyden opening his eyes to the broader literary traditions of Europe out of the German world in which he had come with Goethe and, and, and Kafka as the two literary icons that Hirschman would read and recite um, for the rest of his life. And the last phenomenon was uh, the questioning of abstract certainties and models. This was very important for this uh, Italian uh, turn of mind. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, needless to say, and we can talk about it if you want, uh, what happens to him <coughs> in Italy, what happens to him in Spain. Uh, these are very traumatic uh, moments. And I want to move ahead to uh, Marseille in 1940. Another problem about the relationship of voice and exit. So this is Albert, uh, and this is an, uh, an unnamed um, refugee. We don't know his identity. And you can already see the difficulties, the complex relationship between exit and loyalty and voice, that the, th that the three master concepts that he will become so famous for, in fact, bleed into each other, and not so easy to separate them. By the time he reaches uh, Marseille in 1940, after the fall of France, uh, he has uh, fought in the French army. So you have to imagine here is a German citizen, a Jew, who is fighting for the French as Nazi armies are um, rolling over uh, France. Uh, and in fact, he joined the French army even before the declaration of war uh, in, on the 1st of September uh, 1939. Uh, goes then uh, to Spain, Italy, so forth. And emerges uh, after the fall of France. The story is somewhat well known because he wrote a few essays about how he wound up there. And he became the right hand man to an operation in Marseille that helped refugees uh, escape from uh, the south of France, associated with uh, Varian Fry. I can talk about more in more detail about the Marseille episode. Hirschman has himself no real interest in himself becoming one of the refugees that he's helping escape. His idea is to just help them escape. As far as he is concerned, he's getting away with having a bogus identity, uh, living in Marseille undetected. He has absolutely no German accent uh, to his French. He has, for all intents and purposes, refashioned himself and takes some pride in walking up to test himself, walking up to French policemen, speaking in French, almost daring them to uh, pull the veil back on who he really was. At the same time within him was beginning to brew some unease uh, and an increasing silence about the dark spots uh, associated with uh, the experience of this interwar Europe particularly manifest in the Spanish Civil War. So by the time he arrives in Berkeley, 1941, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, again, more detail on that if you want, he meets a young woman, uh, Sarah, uh, uh, here, and you're gonna see Sarah a lot in the photographs uh, from now on. 
Um, everybody at Berkeley, when he arrives, there's already an aura surrounding him. The little bits and pieces of the story uh, have preceded his arrival for complicated reasons. I'll tell you about it if you want. And everybody starts to ask him there at International House when he moves in, tell us about, um, tell us about Catalonia, tell us about the fall of France, tell us about the Italian resistance, and so on. And he refuses to speak. Sarah herself asks him in their moments, in their private moments, if he would talk about it. He has scars from um, um, uh, the Battle of Monte Pelato in, in, on the Aragonese uh, front, and she asks him to talk about it, and he refuses. To his dying day, he never talked to her about the Spanish Civil War. The question again arises, is he really a refugee? Funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, he hadn't really meant to leave as a refugee. How much was this, uh, how much was he like those that he tried uh, to help? Now, at the very same time, it, as you can see from the date, we are uh, 11 months now, he, by the time he arrives at Berkeley, 11 months from the American entry in the war, and of course, as soon as the United States declares war, he joins for the third time an army to fight fascism. And again, this question of loyalty arises, it's very clear by now, to the cause. But at the same time, it's problematic because he, it's also very clear one of the reasons why he joins the U.S. Army is in order to secure U.S. citizenship. He's actually come to uh, the United States on bogus paper, with the wrong name, bogus papers, declared Lithuanian citizenship, which we, he didn't have, and was afraid that he was going to be deported. And one way to solve the problem was to join the army. I think it still goes on, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, and so how much does he do this for altruistic reasons or for self-interested reasons? He's, and of course, the punchline is he's always trying to keep the balance of the two motivations. Uh, he had great hopes when he joined the American Army that uh, the, he would be deployed. He joins the OSS, which is the precursor to uh, the CIA, uh, which was uh, invented in order to analyze data for the war effort, particularly for the Western European theater. He joins the OSS. By now, you have to realize, so Hirschman, 1942, uh, somebody do the math for me. He's... 20 what? 27. 27. Okay, he's got a PhD. He's already fought in two armies. <laughs> Speaks English, French, Italian, German, Spanish. And he goes to Washington. This is a photograph taken with Sarah in Washington. And he's prowling the halls of what's called the Research and Analysis Division of the OSS. And for those of us who know about the Research and Analysis Division, we have colleagues who worked for it over in Dickinson Hall, they're now retired. This is where the brains, uh, many of the brains of the later social science establishment of the United States uh, would uh, later institutionalize themselves. Uh, some very famous uh, figures, probably the one that was most famous was, was Herbert Marcuse, would work in the research analysis division, uh, producing evaluations of war capacity, the economies behind the lines. Hirschman with a PhD in economics figured, well, ideal candidate to work for research and analysis. This is what he wanted to do. And uh, he uh, was turned down. Instead, he was sent to North Africa where he wallowed for a while and then eventually was sent on the Italian front as a private to follow the American troops as they made their way up. For those of you who know about the Italian campaign, it was absolutely brutal. Uh, uh, in a sense, the forgotten front of the Second uh, World War, um, his job was to translate uh, for captured uh, German uh, soldiers and officers uh, that would be interrogated by Allied and American troops particularly. He did some work for the British uh, as well. Along the way, he becomes very disenchanted, and he writes, uh, in early fall 1945, a letter to Sarah um, back in the United States, who's living with her family in Beverly Hills, writes a letter and says, um, this is my third war, rather this is my third army. 
armies uh, pulverize the individual. Right? And I hate these kinds of organizations. And you can see already here the importance of individualism and, and his liberal thinking. And he tells a story about, uh, and, and, and he's quite depressed here, and occasionally you get glimpses of his depression. Um, he's very good at masking it, but it comes out occasionally. He stumbles into a bookstore uh, in Rome uh, at this point and uh, picks up a book that's for sale there, and, and it's Friedrich Hayek's uh, Road to Serfdom. And the role that Hayek plays in his thinking is a very interesting one. It's actually one that I would say the left who want a particular reading of Hirschman now have some discomfort with. Um, again, we can come back to that some uh, if you want. Uh, the, the story of his involvement in uh, the American military, uh, it, it culminates with a very bizarre uh, episode in which he is asked to translate. So this is Albert. This is the front cover of the New York Times. Sarah, this is in um, mid-November, if I'm not mistaken, 1945. The war is over. It's been over for a while in Italy. Eugenio Colorni, Albert's best friend, I, I, I haven't mentioned this, but Albert has had a series of, of, of tragic episodes as he gets away, but his best friends keep getting killed. So, uh, uh, but Eugenio Colorni is uh, gunned down by uh, na Nazi thugs in Rome uh, just before Albert arrives there. This is one of the reasons why he was very impatient and depressed as in order to get to Italy once he knew that he was going to be sent on the Italian campaign to get to Rome in order to rejoin um, Colorni, who was then the edit underground editor for a magazine called Avanti, for those of you who know about what's happening in Italian politics right on the end of the war. This is General Anton Dosler, the front cover of the New York Times, Sarah opens up her copy, she's in New York, opens up a copy of the New York Times and sees her husband, whom she hasn't seen for years, right, on the front cover of the New York Times. And what is he doing? He's translating for Dosler at the first trial for uh, a Nazi officer. In this case, it's not human rights trial, but it's a war crimes tribunal that's been set up in Italy before you get, before the French and German theaters have been opened up. And Hirschman's job, this is Albert here, this is Dosler, uh, has to translate for him. The trial involved Dosler who gave orders to his troops to execute uh, a handful of an American, Italian-American and Italian uh, uh, spies who were working for the OSS behind the lines who got captured and now they had their dog tags. Though they were in civilian clothes, they had their dog tags on them and nonetheless, Dosler uh, ordered their execution, which was, of course, uh, uh, a uh, violation of their uh, rights as uh, soldier combatants. This was the first trial uh, uh, against a uh, German officer, and it's Hirschman, the man who spent his entire life fighting these guys, now having to sit through the trial as his translator sort of turn on the whole concept of voice. And at the very end, and I'm going to interrupt here, at the very end, Hirschman, Hirschman has to translate the sentence. And the sentence is that Dosler is going to be executed by a firing squad. And after the biography came out, uh, Albert's grandson found this video on YouTube. So I just want to play this for it's very short. Thank you. 
Und das ist auch gemacht. Ich habe noch weiter darüber nachgegründet und heute auch mit dem Als Präsident dieser Kommission ist es meine Pflicht, Sie zu unterrichten, wie Einzelheiten und in Bezug auf die Anfang hier zu Und wiederum. Okay. It goes on to, to give you the sentence. If you want to watch the rest of the video, you can. It's, it's actually of the execution itself. When it's all over, Hirschman leaves. Uh, he nearly faints at the end of it, and he withdraws in silence. The whole story is told in, in the New York Times. Uh, and so imagine Sarah reading the news uh, about uh, her husband. Uh, culminating in the trial, he leaves, uh, returns to Washington, and I'll, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna gloss over a lot of stuff here. He winds up working for the Federal Reserve Board on the Marshall Plan, and uh, until uh, late 1951, uh, there is a brain trust of, of people, uh, one person from each of the division, commerce, the Fed, Treasury, State Department, who uh, provide uh, the intellectual firepower behind the implementation uh, of the Marshall Plan. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail about what happens to him in Washington. It's not a happy story in the end, although the, Wash the, the Marshall Plan, he feels, vindicates the idea that uh, uh, public institutions can do things to make the world uh, better. Uh, things go very badly. I, again, I'm not going to go into details. This part I won't give away. The story is told in the book itself. Um, he gets picked up by uh, a security review, and as the McCarthy uh, paranoia is purging the American civil service, he is, for all intents and purposes, uh, driven out of uh, the uh, federal government employ. And he goes to see a friend of his, Sarah's now with the daughters off in California, visiting her parents. That's another recurring thing that happens. Uh, and after he's been told that he, he's going to have to look for another guy, he gets very afraid, as of course many people are. In this is in early 1952, um, that that something is going to happen to him. He goes to see a friend of his who had actually worked with him in Berkeley an office mate, Sandy Stevenson, who was very high up in the World Bank. He and Sandy and another figure called Alexander Gershenkron, I don't know if this is going to ring a bell for you, share an office together at Berkeley and they are all writing their first book. So he goes to see Sandy at the World Bank and says, I, I, I have a problem. I can't work in the United States anymore. Can you help? And Sandy says, well, it just so happens that the World Bank is trying to reinvent itself. He doesn't quite use those words, but uh, we're going to get in on the development action. There's this thing called development, and there are these places, the word third world hadn't yet, the term hadn't yet been coined, but we can go to the third world and do development there. Now that the cycle of European reconstruction, which is how the World Bank had been originally conceived, although there's now a debate about the world, what really happened at Bretton Woods in 1944 over the World Bank mission, we won't go into that, go to Colombia. Albert goes home, calls Sarah, and says, okay, we're moving to South America. We're going to Colombia. She goes, what? And uh, uh, drops the phone, runs to find an atlas to figure out where Colombia is. The whole family moves to Colombia in early 1952, and these are the best years of the family's lives. Again, sometimes displacement even quasi-voluntary, involuntary of these sorts can yield to outcomes that actually in the case of Albert Hirschman, always looking for ways to turn these things into an advantage. And Colombia was a year, what was a period, they were there for about four and a half years of uh, not just adventure, I, I like this photograph because they're all on horseback up in the highlands outside Bogota, but also to reinvent himself as an economist. The frustrations of what had happened, he couldn't have an academic career for all kinds of reasons. The frustration of working on the Marshall Plan, Colombia gives him a setting in which he can reinvent himself and discovers uh, 
the field of development economics. And in that, in the core, and I went into more detail with, with Krugman uh, on this one, uh, the importance of observation of what development looks like on the ground was very important to him. The role of case studies and thinking about different models of capitalist development rather than being derived from abstract principles uh, of it. This culminates in a, uh, a, a whole different attitude uh, to uh, economic development that will be inscribed in a book that he has just finished when he does this headstand, and I have a lot of photographs of Hirschman doing a headstand. <laughs> I could do a whole lecture on headstands. <laughs> because he's trying to turn the theories of economic development on their heads. Trying to invert how we think about what's going on in economic change. By then he had a very unique intellectual style, always looking for alternatives and possibilities out of the straitjacket and the futilism that really was dominating the ways in which people were thinking about development looking for a model or an approach to an integrated social science without a dominant theory. In fact, very skeptical of grand theorizing. And here you can hear the voice of Eugenio Colorni uh, informing the way he's beginning to develop his concepts. And uh, many years later in a conversation with Clifford Geertz, he will coin something called the number one law of the social sciences, and of course it's facetious because Albert always hated laws of any kind unless it was the rule of law, right? But intellectual laws for him were an oxymoron. <laughs> so he coined one, the only one he ever coined. The number one law of the social sciences, as soon as you think you have a theory that explains the world, it's obsolete. <laughs> right? And that was already clear to him by the late 1950s, right? that he had a very different temperament uh, part of it reflecting his intellectual heritage, uh, part of it reflecting the fact that he had already, by 1958, and this is in Santa Monica, uh, what's he doing on the beach? Uh, when he's not on the beach, he's at the offices of the RAND Corporation, and the RAND is busy trying to formalize an American social science for a Cold War age, and they've brought him in because he's got a lot of skills, and he's one of the few who've, who's actually spent extended number of years in Latin America, in the field, who's now actively thinking about development, but he doesn't have these really, these new fancy uh, methodologies that are now being incubated at places like the RAND Corporation. The RAND Corporation plays a very important role in the modernization of the American social sciences. Anybody's looking for a dissertation topic, that's a good one. Um, Hirschman didn't have these tools. And by then, it's already clear he knows this at the Rand Corporation. He's getting drilled with new mathematical techniques. By then, he's, he's, he's had too much experience. He's, like me many years ago, pretty fossilized in, in how he thinks about things. And it's also very clear that he prefers thinking about complexity to looking for certainty. And that's, by the 1960s, something of attention uh, within American social science. And that development was not just about taking simple folk from the countryside and making them more complicated and ready for uh, the modern life. And he would go on to write a trilogy about economic development, starting with Strategy of Economic Development, which is published in 1958, uh, Journeys Toward Progress uh, in the early 1960s, when that f first photograph that I showed you was taken in Colombia, he goes back to Colombia. And the third would be a study of World Bank projects from the mid-1960s called Development Projects Observed. Very important word, observation, in all of this. That you can't derive concepts and theoretical schemata without knowing what you're talking about. He goes back to his, um, the, the insistence on the use of case studies for uh, social science. When he finished that trilogy in the late 1960s, one of the case studies he looks at is a railroad in Nigeria. He publishes the evaluation of the World Bank book, and on the heels of its publication, of course, the Biafran Civil War erupts. And he's very disturbed that his social science wasn't able to account for the unintended consequence of the World Bank intervention uh, in Nigeria. And it's from that, in a sense, concern that uh, 
uh, development was going awry and increasing pessimism that he would write his most famous book, Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, already picking up a vocabulary that he himself has been living. Right? Uh, this is in Stanford in um, uh, 1969, which is where he writes this, and brings to fruition, writes the book, brings to fruition many years of thinking about psychology, politics, economics, and his argument was that people contained within themselves many propensities, right? many motivations, and people, we are internally complex beings, not simple. And already you can see the tension he's going to have with what it becomes by the 1970s a mainstream concept of homo economicus. But he's also very concerned with the growing disenchantment, not just with development, but uh, with, uh, by the early 1970s, with the idea of progress altogether. And this is a, uh, the backside of, um, uh, of a receipt uh, from uh, the faculty club at Harvard, where he's now become, I haven't talked about his professional career. No, if you want to know about it, we can talk about it. After lunch, he's had with Tom Schelling, whom he's known from Marshall Plan days and at the RAND. Schelling was working on his strategy book, while well, Hirschman was working on his strategy book, and with a young Marxist economist called Sam Bowles. These names, I mean, these are big figures in, in, in economics, uh, gra trying to grapple with the problem of inequality in this case. And he coins out of that lunch this uh, image. Uh, I'll give you at least one of his uh, metaphors or his aphorisms, which is the tunnel effect. And the tunnel effect, people familiar with the tunnel effect? The tunnel effect, so Hirschman is stuck uh, going into a tunnel um, coming out of Logan Airport in Boston and stuck in traffic and he sees that and everybody's sitting around in their cars waiting for the traffic to, to, to lighten up. And when the lane beside him starts to move, every, he sees that everybody around him is delighted Right? We too are eventually going to be able to move too. After a, a little while, people's elation then turns into outrage as they start honking, thinking that the reason they're not advancing like the lane beside them is because somebody up front must be doing something bad. And what he tries to capture, even though you are objectively no worse off, you are emotionally irate because somebody else is becoming better off than you are. And this is called the tunnel effect. It's a major influence on uh, the role of the cognitive relationship between cognitive science and policy making. So, but he's very concerned about how people are getting upset. Right? In the 1970s, it's very important uh, for understanding how we get people like Ronald Reagan and others right, who are capitalizing on this mood. And he feels he has to intervene in this. And he intervenes in, in this mood in various ways. One is to publish. Uh, off and on again, my favorite of his books, Passions and the Interest. This is uh, uh, a photograph taken in Paris in 1975 as he's completing the manuscript of the Passions uh, and, and the Interests. And he would go on, as a result of all of this, to become one of the most famous social scientists of the world, arguing that contained within People are competing ambitions and aspirations, passions and interests, exit voice and loyalty. The conjunction is always important in his title. It's not or. We're always trying to combine these things. Um, and this was very difficult for him, also personally. In 1977, just to give you two uh, uh, stories, 1977, he goes to Russia with Sarah, who's herself a Russian emigre. Uh, and one night after having gone to the theater, uh, there's a storm in Moscow. Uh, he's gone to the theater with Sarah. In the play that they go see, he is sitting beside a Soviet officer whose chest is dripping with medals. They go back to the hotel, Albert and Sarah, and in the middle of the night, while the thunder is crashing out loud, uh, outside the hotel room, uh, Hirschman wakes up in a fit mumbling in German uh, something about Marx's thesis on Feuerbach. And Sarah has to say to him, and, 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 and the point is about sacrifice. And Sarah has to calm him down, right? that, that he's getting very agitated. And whether it was the memory 
of Berlin in 1933. What was really going on for him was unclear, but these old debates that have been haunting him, right, and of his old friends, are still very alive in his mind. It is also clear when he agrees, Klaus Affe, the German sociologist, arranges to have Exit Voice and Loyalty translated into German, and the German publishers ask Hirschman to write a preface to the German edition. It's a very short little document, but it's a weird one because he talks about, and he very seldom at that stage in his life, talked about his personal life. It's one of the first cases when she does this, talks about his own leaving of Germany in 1933 and about the guilt that he's had to live with all along. And he makes the point that how young Jewish activists like him prefer, opted very often to leave Germany rather than to defend the Jews who stayed behind and therefore made them more vulnerable to the Holocaust. Now, this was a pretty shocking uh, document when Quentin Skinner uh, read uh, the draft of the preface said, you know, Albert, you're being really harsh on yourself. It's not like you are to blame for the Holocaust. The point that Hirschman was really trying to make is that the exit option has costs, right? including the costs that he himself had displaced upon fellow uh, family uh, members. So while we might celebrate this cosmopolitan moralist, uh, there is a darker side uh, to all of this. And let me end with just two images now. The first is of Albert now becoming uh, a figure uh, in the world of letters in Europe. This is him giving uh, the Marc Bloch lectures at the Sorbonne in 1982. Those essays, by the way, are in The Essential Hirschman. They're amazing pieces, actually. Uh, I, I could reread Hirschman's essays many times, and I've read them many times, and each time you have a different readerly experience. He has clearly, by the early 1980s, become something of a sage and travels around the world called upon by governments and intellectuals to, to, to share his insights. But that's not the only space in which he uh, feels uh, mobilized to intervene. One more image. Another is back in the field of economic development. And in this case, it's, uh, here it is. It's uh, field work that he's done in the early 1980s, which will produce his least well-known book, in fact, completely obscure, called Getting Ahead Collectively, Grassroots Experiences in Latin America. And it's produced as um, a supplement to a journal called um, World Development, uh, it's, if you're interested, uh, it's a, a remarkable uh, little book. Uh, but what I want to draw your attention to is while this figure can be doing these kinds of things, he's also doing these kinds of things. In this case, talking to a Dominican peasant about the problem of land, right? and going back to uh, the sources uh, to look at people's experiences in development uh, in Latin America in the middle of a debt crisis evaluating problems of development on the ground to find that the poor were actively engaged in improving their lives. Moreover, that they were doing this collectively and not individually. And so searching for clues uh, from everyday life to reveal the surprising stories that are chronicled in the little book, often in the face of great adversity. Proving Hamlet wrong. In this particular case, though, it's not the intellectuals who are doing it, but the peasants, the fishermen, the bicycle repairmen. And he's speaking then to two different audiences. In fact, the book, one of the reasons why social scientists pay no attention, there's no formal theory. It's stories. He's telling chronicles that he hopes the peasants themselves will be able to, if not read, uh, uh, consider for themselves through intermediaries. And we were talking about Sarah's own project for um, uh, uh, something called Gente Cuentos, which if you're interested, we could talk about. So let me conclude. Here we have a, a singular ability to render complex lives and processes in simple parables or explanations, hence the reliance on Montaigne. So when Hirschman crosses the Mir Pyrenees in late uh, 1940, when the Gestapo are finally catching up with him from Marseille, uh, he carries in his satchel an extra pair of socks, and the two volumes of Montaigne's essays. 
and the role that aphorisms and literary images play in his study. In fact, he always thought of social science as a branch of literature. Secondly, a figure who never saw social science as separate from world affairs. Right? He was a pragmatic idealist. Um, you might call him a kind of moralist, but that his, what was important about that was that his analytical tools were embedded historically. And that this knowledge that came from observation and analysis was meant to expand the range of people's possibilities. For him, the crusade, the purpose was to hold up a lantern to illuminate the role then of the imagination in social change and magnifying the possibilities for the future. And in that way, turn Karl Marx on his head. Thank you very much. Go back to what you started with, the exemplary life. Mm. So as a provocation, one could imagine, for example, that there's an exemplary social science mm -hmm. or an exemplary orthogonal approach to social science. And one could, for example, polemicize that this is a type of social science that has deserves reconsideration, or, but you seem not to have chosen that path. That's a great question. Uh, I'm, I'm very struck uh, by, I mean, it just, it was, it was luck. I, I don't think Albert planned it this way, although I wouldn't put it past him uh, that he should die when the book comes out. Uh, in the, both the obituaries about him and in the reviews of the book um, and the ways in which, the, the nostalgia that surrounds the memory of him. The way I've tried to write this book, though, is, uh, is in a non-nostalgic way. While I was emotionally very attached to him, <coughs> and there are many things about his social science that I admire, it is very important to recognize its limitations. Um, and, and we can go into more detail I, I, if you want on this. There was an effort in some senses in the 1970s that he and Cliff Geertz in uh, their model of the School of Social Science at the Institute was to create an interpretive alternative to the analytical social science, which is what dominates the uh, professional disciplines of the social sciences in the United States. That, I think, Albert and Cliff would have recognized as having failed. Right? And that it's n there is not necessarily a road back to that one. And, and that we're better off just accepting what happened to the interpretive uh, social science. The other thing that is singular about him and is very hard to emulate, I mean, this is not written as an effort to come up with a template that we should all be cosmopolitan moralists and work in a gazillion number of languages, although some people here do, uh, and, and beat ourselves up for our deficiencies, but rather to locate this intellectual temperament in a particular place and time that is related to a fundamental trauma, and that is the political implosion of Middle Europe in the 1930s. Right? Um, and, and what that did for our broader human sciences as that generation of scholars fanned out to reshape history, economics, politics, and so forth. So, rather, so the example is not so much one that we should be trying to follow as much as an example of a historic moment, one that gave rise to both the dissonant and the orthodox models of the social sciences. Yeah. So what aspects of Hayek did he incorporate yeah. into his thought? Sorry, this is the thing about giving away uh, <laughs> red meat to people. Uh, so he reads The Road to Serve, and you have to realize he's reading it when he's serving in an army, and for those who know, of you who know anything about armies, that they're very vertical organizations. The individual really does not count, in fact, it's not purpose to account for uh, much. Um, and it's very bureaucratic. And he can't get answers for why, um, why he can't climb up the ladder in the OSS. The story is told in the book. 
and it has to do with the FBI file that shocked the family when I got it declassified. And I won't tell you what it is. You can find that chapter told in the book. So Hayek gives him clues about what's happening in uh, uh, what, what large organizations uh, do in trumping the, the, the will of individuals. There's another side of Hayek that Hirschman takes away, um, and he goes back to read Hayek quite frequently in his life, uh, is the role of friction, instability, disequilibria in producing innovation, which is one of the reasons why he was a dissident of much of the orthodoxy in economic thinking by the late 1950s, which was always looking for the master plan, general equilibrium. Uh, Hirschman believed much more in the role of unintended consequences uh, uh, and of underlying instability, so that our social science shouldn't be looking for ways to get rid of disequilibria, but rather to produce more creative disequilibria. Uh, and this is one of the facets he, he draws out of Hayek. But it doesn't sound like, like Hayek with the, with the market mechanisms coming from individual, you know, the really, really libertarian, you know, low level pricing the telecom mechanisms and stuff. It doesn't sound like, I mean, like, for that, that's not Hayek at all. Well, there is an, ele an element of Hayek, if you think that Hirschman says the private sector, not the public sector, uh, it's uh, 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 what we would now call uh, small agents transacting on the ground. His, and in fact, in, if you read strategy, which is when he really goes back most clearly to read Hayek, you can see it's not libertarian, but he's trying to reconcile individual agency and the role of the marketplace in the private sector in opposition to the world bankers who want the state, who want master plans, uh, who want overall coordinated efforts to try to shake inert societies right, into the developed world. Rather, he wants to rely on bottom-up, market-driven, uh, individualized activity, which doesn't mean, and this again comes back to the competing urges, that for individuals to have agency, they can't work together uh, collectively. Right? I'm not saying he resolves this. This is a tension right, that he's trying to, uh, trying to bring together. Have you traced the possible ways in which having lived in Colombia during the period of La Violencia may have affected his yeah. scholarship? I mean, you focus a lot on him serving in three armies and yeah. different mm -hmm. wars, but how about that internal conflict? In which ways did it affect him, either personally yeah. or scholarly? So Colombia, when he arrives uh, in uh, May of 1952, is still in the midst of sort of coming out of the worst of uh, a spasm of violence called La Violencia. Uh, and so you would think this would be an improbable place for people to think of development as having a happy story to it. But uh, first of all, La Violencia was very, um, there is a, retrospective way in which we think of all of Colombia involved in a civil war. In fact, it was very provincialized. And he did not have that much direct encounter with the violence per se. Right? Actually, there's a way in which there's an odd, his, his, his euphoria about small investors, farmers, and so on developing is at odds with the larger view that Colombia is a country in real trouble in the 1950s. Uh, so if anything, La Violencia, he wants to, in fact, keep it to one side. So he writes in 1954 a little essay called What's Going Right in Colombia? And he sends it to Tom Schelling, uh, who's then an economist at Yale. and. This is how he winds up resurfacing and, and going to Yale, is because he sends to, to Schelling, look, I'm trying to find the good version of the story, and it's coming from the farmers and the small investors, and, and everybody thinks everything's going wrong in Colombia. There are good stories here. And Schelling goes to the chair of the economics department, says, look, this guy's really got some interesting ideas here. Why don't we bring him up for a year? Uh, this is on a Ford Foundation grant, and Hirschman, this is in 1956. 
end of 56, he comes to Yale, and we'll, that's where he's going to write begin the first draft of strategy. So La Violencia itself as a war, if it has an effect on him, it's the, it's, it's the negative effect. In other words, he's trying to turn around to say, in spite of all the defeatism and the hand-wringing, there are good stories to be found here. Lewis. This may be an unfair question, but I was wondering if uh, Albert Hirschman was alive today, how he might interpret the current political, social, and economic malaise that we, we're experiencing. I'm just a historian, Lewis, so I... I <laughs> I don't, that's that kind of thing. I, uh, what I would say, though, is that in, um, when George Bush Sr. runs against Governor Dukakis in the elections of 1988, uh, I was in Argentina at the time, so I don't have to remember any of this stuff, but I know this from the files. Um, Bush uh, beats up Dukakis as a liberal the L word becomes a negative aspersion. And Hirschman will, uh, along with Daniel Bell and many others, sign a manifesto which is published in the full page ad in the New York Times to defend the word liberal. And to make the case there that words can be instruments of war and are indicative of a growing mood of intolerance in the United States. And it's in the wake of that that Hirschman will write a very short essay, it's also in The Essential Hirschman, for the Atlantic Monthly called Reactionary Rhetoric. That article spreads like wildfire. It's in the days before internet, right? So it's not like sent around as attachments. But everybody's reading this piece that Hirschman has somehow, just as exit voice and loyalty, caught a moment in the late 1960s about issues of collective action and individual action, the rhetoric of reaction caught the ways in which political discourse was getting uh, tracked into very uh, hidebound uh, uh, ways of thinking. Uh, now, Hirschman originally wanted to call the book, and, and then the publishers line up to, to turn the article into a book, he wanted to call it uh, the rhetoric of intransigence. Right? It was originally called the rhetoric of of reaction, Hirschman then thought the left was equally prone to this problem. And I'm not saying it's the Obama's problem, because I don't think it is. But he said, beware of left-wing versions of intransigence. And that's the problem. If we want a democratic discourse, you need a transigent form or way of talking, uh, and what he called an open cognitive style. And so if I think if Hirschman if you want clues to how Hirschman would think about this, you might want to look at the book that came out. His title never went anywhere. It was called The Rhetoric of Reaction. He had a final chapter in that book on the left, which a lot of people didn't like, because they wanted Hirschman to be the icon of a different kind of social science. And he kept resolutely f refusing to fit into that uh, version of, of, of him. Um, so if you wanted some clues, you might want to look at that, that book. The, the reason why the publishers, I should say, because publishers, we need them, but at the same time they are a pain in the ass, they, 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 want, they thought re reactionary rhetoric would really sell the book, and it did. And he was never particularly happy with it. And it's very telling that in Spanish and in German, they gave it the original title of the rhetoric of intransigence. Uh. Uh, this is another sort of unfair uh, journalistic question. Uh, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> no, I'm just. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just wondering, and I, I'm going to ask you, I guess, to put yourself into Hirschman's mind. What, what, what would you make of the current uh, crop of uh, development activists, yeah. uh, social scientific development activists? Right. And I'm thinking particularly of Jeffrey Sachs, who yeah. his reputation has oscillated so extraordinarily yeah. of late. I mean. He was contra to the World Bank for such a long time and seemed to be something of a radical, and now is subject of a quite a, a ferocious vilification in a new book. Yeah, yeah, that's an amazing book, actually. Well, actually, the pendular moves that, that Sachs make go, are several even before that, because you have to remember that he's an advisor to the missions that go to Bolivia in the 1980s that recommend you know, shock therapy uh, before he then becomes anti-World Bank and then swings back. Uh, with the Millennial Village Project and others. Um, 
I mean, Sachs himself thinks of himself as a Hirschmannian. Of course, Albert, in his vain version, and he was vain like many of us, would have been only too happy to accept Sachs as a disciple, but they think very differently. Uh, yes, Sachs is a kind of solutionist, and, and Albert was always uh, never particularly enamored of social science for its own sake, which I think is getting to this question of an engaged uh, social science. But at the same time, this one-size-fits-all modular style that Sachs keeps recycling, and there's a reason why he's so pendular, because his one size doesn't work over here, I'm going to swing over here, and that doesn't work, and I'm going to swing over here. That Hirschman would have had no time for. Um, but there was, there, there was both an identity and, 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 and a disidentification process between them. Whether Hirschman would have been more uh, interested in the group, say at MIT, in the Poverty Action Lab, that sort of on the ground, observationally driven social science, I think is more the style that he would have said. Those are more likely to give you clues about how to get out of, um, how to get out of binds, right? That don't require, and this is again the Sachs, Sachs always believed in the outside big intervention. Whichever it was, people get caught in traps, right? And they're bereft of the ability to get out of these traps. They don't have the resources to, and that what requires massive investment, shock therapy, whatever it might be. And Hirschman would always say, actually, there's a lot more latent potential. Uh, you don't need to impose, and he's always, this is getting a little bit more into the weeds of his style of social science, always looking for what he called an endogenous theory, that there's something inside social action that will give you clues for how people can get out of these things that only look like traps from the outside. And this is why I say, going back to Steve's question, there's an element of a failure there because he, always, he, he didn't believe in traps. That was circular thinking. But there are times in which we're caught in traps, right? And, and, and he would minimize the effects of outside intervention. You could see the, in the echo in, among development economists now would be with people like Easterlin and others, or Angus Deaton, who would point to the futility of these large-scale efforts to, to shake people out of their homeostasis. Is that answering? Yeah. I've got a question about the work of biography itself. Uh -huh. In the book, you draw a lot on letters, you draw a lot on what seems to be uh, notebooks and such notes. Um, and I'm wondering if you found that to be unusually expansive, um, your engagement with those kinds of materials. Was Hirsch, did Hirschman stand out in that way? I mean, obviously, there's enough material to create a, a large, rich biography. Um, but he's moving around a lot and displaced and yeah. so I'm curious about whether that part of Hirschman's life mattered and what you made of that. Well, so um, I'll be anecdotal to start with, which was for a very long time as I was working on the book, I actually didn't think I could pull a story together. It goes back to the the challenge of combining the, in, this, for lack of a better way of formulating it, the inner and the outer worlds, right? Um, because I didn't have much access to that inner world. Just as Albert refused to talk to Sarah about the Spanish Civil War and other episodes of his life, he didn't talk to me about them, and he didn't talk to anybody. As far as I can tell, there's only one person who knows from oral detail what Albert went through, and that's a Spanish uh, historian who lives in, in Barcelona. It's the only person Albert would ever open to just on that particular chapter. And Albert never wrote any letters from Spain. In fact, not entirely sure if you, if you read the book. So that, chap, that part where he goes to Spain, I don't know if you notice how I conjugate uh, a lot of the prose, is quite speculative. I have to piece around to try to figure out what he did, which, who he knew, where those people, and, and they function as cognates for his story. Um, so there's a methodological problem about the absences and the missing spaces. I approach this to some extent, 
as a Hirschman would be want to do, uh, to turn the anomalies, the silences, the, 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 the things we don't know um, into part of the story itself. So his silencing is purposive in some kind of way. What does it tell us about him? Uh, and there's a really lovely meditation on this by you know, uh, Hermione Lee in one of her essays um, in Virginia Woolf's Nose. So not the biography, the collection of essays on method, biographical method, about what you do with things you don't know anything about. Um, so that's the, 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 so there's a methodological issue. So what is he doing when he's not talking? What's he saying to us? Um, uh, there is a, a, another side to this, which is how you lose his, pa I lose his paper trail all of the time. And one of the difficulties dealing with such a fractured life is the paper keeps disappearing. You'd think in some senses there would be this large epistolary accumulation because he'd be writing less, but these people are, have their lives wrecked many times and leave papers behind. In fact, we only have some of the letters were recuperated uh, at the end of the war, Albert goes from Italy uh, in December 1945, after the Dossler execution, he goes to France and recovers in, um, um, in Rue de, uh, de Turenne in the Marais, where he has been living in the 1930s. If you know anything, that's the Jewish um, the ghetto in Paris, closest to the ghetto that there would have been for Jews, and recovers his trunk which has been in the attic of the petit hotel that he's been living in after he's been forced to leave Italy in September of 1938 when Mussolini issues his anti-Semitic decrees. And I thank God he saved that, that, and then he ships it home with the, with the army, and that's full of paper. But a lot of it gets lost along the way. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time talking to family, trying to get them to go through old letters, piecing it all together. Uh, when you deal with global personal histories like this, you're having to deal with these very, f not just fractured lives, but fractured sources that to me were indispensable for closing this gap between the inner and the outer lives. Um, so. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Hale.